Well, the mics are back on, the cameras too, and this is Radio Entrepreneurs, and we are being viewed and, and observed and liked more than ever before because we are talking to entrepreneurs who are trying to keep this economy going in the new economy, and that's what it's all about. It's uh, the old ways are the old ways, and then there are the new ways. Uh, and my co-host for this segment is uh, the one and the only uh, Walter Sullivan of uh, Walter Sullivan uh, and your law firm, right, Walter? I can't see the logo from here. I got to work on that, don't I? <laughs> yeah. How you doing, Walter? Oh, I'm doing wonderful. Like the week keeps growing, and we have a great week. Guest today, don't we? Yes, we do. Our next guest, because obviously, if you're on your co-host, we're going to be talking about cannabis. Uh, is uh, Michael Dundas, cannabis entrepreneur. Welcome, Michael. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Oh, uh, the I, cannabis industry uh, taking a little bit more of a hit maybe during these times because uh, different issues. I won't go into them. I'll let you go into them. Tell me how the cannabis industry is sort of adapting right now to what's going on. I have to say, I think the industry generally, in Massachusetts in particular, is adapting very, very well to extraordinarily difficult times. Obviously, uh, everybody is facing an uphill challenge with this COVID-19 thing. It uh, came out of left field. Um, but uh, cannabis in particular, regulated cannabis, and in particular, adult use or recreational uh, cannabis, really taken a tough hit uh, with uh, the governor finding that it is not an essential business and essentially ordering it closed. Uh, all these new shops uh, basically have had to close, close up shop, can't even do curbside delivery, can't do, or curbside takeout, can't do delivery. Um, until uh, this order is lifted. Uh, but I think that we have had um, an uptick on the medical side. So medical cannabis, as you, your listeners probably know, has been deemed uh, an essential service. Those companies have really risen to the occasion. And so we've seen uh, a real quick pivots to curbside pickup, uh, to delivery models. Uh, and I think that the industry has, has picked up quickly. We've also seen, interestingly, uh, with the loosening up of, uh, of the restrictions related to how patients get access to medical marijuana. And in particular, I'm talking about uh, telemedicine, folks being able to get their recommended uh, recommendations or certifications for medical cannabis uh, over the internet. Uh, it's uh, really boosted the, the available patient base. But ultimately, I think uh, it's, uh, it's really going to come back as soon as the governor lifts this, uh, this order on uh, adult use dispensaries. And now, Michael, on Saturday, the industry met with the governor's advisory board on developing a way of opening. Do you know anything what occurred at the meeting? You know, I don't have any uh, inside information there, but looking at the governor's uh, recent declaration that there's going to be a four-phase opening, uh, and, and look, it's anybody's guess. I'm purely speculating here. My guess is that we're probably going to see adult-use cannabis shops opening in phase two, that we're going to see the, uh, the, the, the folks that can open very quickly, that have no, no hands-on, no touch, uh, will be phase one. But I think that uh, you know, regulated cannabis has been lobbying very hard. That They are, in fact, equipped to operate uh, under uh, you know, COVID uh, restrictions. And I think that um, you know, if anyone can operate in a highly regulated atmosphere, it's, it's medical and adult use cannabis. They've shown that they can do that responsibly again and again and again. And I think that we're going to see that from the industry going forward. But I would say my guess is that it'll be a phase two, not, not phase one. Michael, is it I'm sorry, Jeffrey. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Walter, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think it becomes an issue is the industry will survive. The question is, will individuals survive? And it'd be interesting to hear Michael's take on that. I just want to say, Walter, I think you might be picking your phone up. It's throwing a reflection off and on on the screen. So, yes, sit closer. Thank you. We get a better video. Thank you. Look, so I think that the, the folks that were hardest hit by this ban were the newly licensed independent recreational retail operators. They don't have uh, vertical integrated operations to support them. They're not doing cultivation or, or manufacturing. They don't have access to the medical market. I'm strictly talking about the adult use. Uh, retail shops. Many of those folks had just opened their doors. For example, we saw that very first uh, economic empowerment group in, in Boston, city of Boston, Pure Oasis. They've been open for uh, you know a week or two, and all of a sudden uh, told to close their doors. I think that uh, you know what we've seen in the past is the industry does rally around itself and try to do its best to help uh, it, its uh, its compatriots here. I think that uh, hopefully we won't see too many uh, loss. Hopefully, we won't see any losses of, of actual 
organizations. Um, but I think the ones that are the most at risk are those independent operators. So we should be paying close attention to those folks. Now, Michael, to deal with this, the Cannabis Control Commission had two phases they dealt with. The first, after the governor's order, all adult use was closed. Uh, they ended up amending that order and allowing adult use manufacturers and cultivators to open if they were providing uh, cannabis to medical dispensaries. How has that worked out, if at all? I think that was a very important move by the commission. Uh, essentially, what it allowed for was to prevent the stoppage of medical operators who were producing uh, medical cannabis uh, for adult use. So we've seen quite a bit of medical operators who haven't been licensed in the retail uh, side to be continually uh, producing medical cannabis, growing medical cannabis in their medical cannabis facilities, but selling it wholesale to adult use uh, uh, retail outlets. Well, uh, you know, it's a long pipeline in order to, to, to grow these plants. It takes four months essentially from seed to final package. And if the industry were forced to uh, essentially stop planting, uh, then it could, it, it could incur long-term uh, sort of supply stoppages that would be bad for everyone. That covers the medical use cultivators, but the order actually allowed adult use cultivators to sell, correct? Uh, that, that's correct as well. So you would think if you looked at the initial order, the initial order said no adult use activity whatsoever. And I think what the order meant to say was no retail, no touching uh, uh, customers, no uh, allowing folks to congregate. However, uh, you know, again, the pipeline for uh, producing cannabis, recreational or uh, uh, medical, uh, is four months. And so what the order allowed was for recreational cultivators to continue to plant seeds and engage in their cultivation activities, even though they weren't allowed to, uh, to, to open to the general public. Now, the second thing that the Cannabis Control Commission just did, they just did it on Thursday or Friday. Uh, they're putting out applications for delivery. Um, they're only going to apply to economic empowerment, social equity applicants, and uh, micro businesses. The idea of that is to try to see if that can help uh, boost the industry. What do you think? Will that work? I think over the long term, it will. And you know, I think that we're everyone's looking very carefully, entrepreneurs, business people in general, are looking very carefully at all of the different sort of unexpected. Uh, implications that have come out of this COVID-19 phenomenon. I think one of them in cannabis is clearly going to be somewhat of a pivot toward uh, toward delivery, uh, both on the adult use and on the on the medical side. I think that uh, you know delivery licenses have been contemplated by the commission for a long time. This is a long time coming, and so I think that uh, like drug it, stores. Yeah, I mean, essentially, like drugstores, there are, there are rules uh, in place around the delivery program in Massachusetts. As you said, Walter, it's only open for the initial two years to economic empowerment and social equity applicants. But there are also other uh, sort of constraining rules that, uh, that prevent those folks from warehousing uh, cannabis and they can't operate a, a cultivation uh, a, a company as well. And so I think that there, there's going to be interplay between these new delivery companies and the existing uh, infrastructure and supply chain, uh, but overall, I do think it's going to help uh, in the long term. Now, there are currently 18 medical marijuana dispensaries that have the ability to deliver. Mm. Would it yeah, have been if, 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 if people often get confused that delivery, delivery, what we're talking about with the Cannabis Control Commission is adult use delivery. Right. Uh, delivery for for medical marijuana has always been included in the license type of a of a what we call or we used to call an RMD today we call an MTC a, mar a medical marijuana treatment center. But there are only eighteen right now that actually do delivery, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And so you got to remember, of course, delivery is a highly regulated activity. It's uh, capital intensive to start it up. You got to get a fleet of trucks that, that have all kinds of bells and whistles in terms of GPS and reporting and all, all types of uh, you know, two, two uh, paid agents in the car at all times. Um, and so it's, uh, it's not an easy task to stand one of these systems up uh, from a regulatory perspective, which is, uh, I think, why we haven't seen more uh, uh, uptake on that in the recent days. Well, yeah, so my question, my question to you is, Walter, I'm sorry. Walter, uh, you know, it's funny, we run, we've used so much time. Uh, we'd love to get you back again, Michael, to talk about some of these subjects. Would you be willing to come back again? Of course, anytime, just let me know. I'd love to jump in and ask some more questions to get Walter again to talk about it. And Michael, if someone's looking for you to find out more information, how would they do that? Uh, anybody can reach me at any time. I'm available on Gmail, michaeldundas at gmail.com. Good. And Walter, how can people find you? 
at W Sullivan at WalterSullivanLaw.com. Good. I want to remind everybody, this is Radio Entrepreneurs. Everybody stay well, stay healthy, and more stories to follow. <laughs>